Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Miriam Klein Kasanov, and I'm so very pleased to invite you to this discussion on this incredible film, They Survived Together, on behalf of the Miami Jewish Film Festival. So with that said, uh, let me introduce you to the producer of this very fine film, um, John Rakosny. Am I pronouncing that correctly, John? Perfect. Beautiful. I'm so happy to meet you. Oh, it's great this to film here. is just amazing. I have seen many films related to Holocaust, read many memoirs, read hundreds of memoirs, and without exaggeration, seen hundreds of film memoirs. But this story of survival really touched me. What a family, what resistance, what resilience. Congratulations on a superb film that I highly recommend for community and for student and teacher use. I, I really appreciate you saying that. It's been, it's been our joy to make this film and to share this story. Um, it's, it's a labor of love. It, it, it comes from our heart. So I'm, I'm glad if, if that comes through. It did. Uh, for the audience, whether you've seen the film or you have not, this film is about the Niger, am I pronouncing the family name? Yes. Family from Krakow, Poland, a mother and father, Herman and Sarah, and their five children, siblings, Basia, Tosia, Hanka, Ben, and Cecilia. This is about their miraculous escape from the Krakow ghetto in 1943 and their ultimate survival of the Nazi Holocaust. So for question one, let's start from the beginning. John, how did this story come to you? Tell us. Uh, my partner, um, my producer partner and life partner, Andrea Redmond and I uh, lived in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And we used to go to this local cafe um, where uh, everybody was friendly to each other. It was regulars, um, you know, every, it was the place that everybody knew your name. And <clears throat> there was a woman um, who I saw there uh, a few times and I, you know, finally introduced myself to her. And she is Hanka from the film, mm -hmm. um, the middle sister. Um, and we started chatting and, uh, and you know that that went on for a, a couple of months, and and one day we were both sitting out in front of the cafe. It was a nice summer night, and she said, "I really would like you to read my children's book." And I said, "Okay, fine. You know, bring it in, and I'll I'll buy a copy from you. You know, not just expecting your average children's book." And uh, this went on for a while. She kept saying, "You got to read my book. You got to read my book." And I and we were like, "Oh yeah, we'd love to." And one night we were eating dinner and she said, I'm going to wait here until you're finished with dinner and we're going to go back to my apartment and we're going to, you're going to get the book. So we went back to her apartment and Andrea and I both read the book and halfway through the book, I said, I know what I'm going to be doing in my mind. I said, I know what I'm going to be doing for the next few years. Um, she, Hanka wrote this book called The Red Hat. And she wrote it for her granddaughter's bat mitzvah as a gentle way to tell the family story. And it was full of beautiful illustrations, which you see in the film, and just a lovely, a lovely book um, telling a harrowing story. And you know, we use a lot of that in the in the film. We use the book as a as a thread for the film. Uh, the narration and the, uh, the illustrations, as I said. So we, you know, that's how, that was our first introduction. We, we read the book uh, at Hanka's apartment on the Lower East Side and, uh, and just our jaws dropped when we read it. I think this is what we call in Yiddish, Bashert, 
which means it was meant to be that you and Hanka, two people from two different generations and cultures, I'm sure, meeting at a coffee shop and look what came of it, this <clears throat> superb memoir film. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm not quite sure that you're probably not a Holocaust scholar or historian, so you must have had a great deal of a challenge to uh, have to go back into history and particularly to uh, let us know the history of the Krakow ghetto. So what I thought you would tell the audience quickly, because I am very familiar with the Warsaw ghetto because I was actually trained in Holocaust uh, studies by the leaders of the Warsaw ghetto, but I never really knew that much about the Krakow ghetto. So would you like to tell the audience what you discovered about the uh, Krakow ghetto? Why is it called the Krakow ghetto? Where is Krakow geographically? And why uh, was Hanka's family, her brothers and sisters and parents, ultimately ended up in the Krakow ghetto? Well, their family had been in Krakow for centuries. Which um, is a major city in Poland. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a big city in Poland. It's uh, I guess it's sort of central and southern uh, in Poland. Um, and yeah, they their family had been there uh, for centuries because, as they state in the film, that the the kings uh, in Poland were um, I guess more lenient or forgiving and. You know, tolerant of Jews, so it was a, it was a good place for Jews to to uh, migrate to and uh, and live there. So, and so well, we, Poland Poland did have the largest population of Jews in Europe, uh, almost four hundred thousand uh, before they were taken to the various ghettos and camps. Um, so they, when the Nazis came into Poland, they established the Krakow ghetto where they forcibly moved uh, the Jews of Krakow uh, into that ghetto, just like they did in Warsaw, just like they did in other countries. Your film footage is excellent. Where did you go to to get such incredible film footage? Yes, oh, thank you. Um... We did a lot of research. Um, we have we had a uh, one of our co-producers, uh, Lola Denizio, um, uh, studied the Holocaust at Columbia University, and uh, she was our research person. and um, And we developed a a, a very good connections uh, with the United States Holocaust Museum, good. United States Memorial Holocaust Museum, and. Um, so we had an ongoing relationship with them and uh, we just, you know, just kept digging and digging and uh, it, it was quite a, quite a process uh, going through all the archival and, and, and uh, finding the right stuff. And um, so, and it's not easy too. It's not an easy job for, you know, um, to look at a lot of the, you know, very, very disturbing footage. Um, we didn't put in a lot of that, you know, very disturbing stuff in our film um but but we had to go through it and uh and you know at the end of the day it's it's, it's you know you know what can you say it's it's, hor it's horrifying you know i know as i was watching it i thought to myself you know no matter how many times i have watched and seen films and was a part myself as a child survivor escaping the Holocaust. I am still appalled to this moment about the inhumanity of the Nazis toward the Jews. And I think that your film, that is one of the um, hopefully lessons that come out of it uh, at the end. How can we tell our students that and our teachers in our community, we can't allow this kind of thing to ever happen again. Am I correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel the same way with you. I, I just, there's certain things that, you know, happen in, in, in the world where, you know, they're, they're horrible and, 
you can, but you can somehow trail back to, you know, how and why somebody got to that point, you know, mm -hmm. poverty or starvation or, you know, desperate situations. But these people were not the Nazis. They were not in any of those situations. And for all of them to go along with it and just, just snowball into this horrifying, you, you just can never, never understand any, any of it, you know? It, it is, it, it baffles you every time you think about it. You know? I think the um, warning signs in all civilizations are there, yeah. but that we just don't pay attention to them until too late. So before I get political, which would cause me a great deal of problems, I will move on to an, well, another question. But it's interesting that you say that because um, in, 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 one of the, in, the, in one of the sections of the films, in the film, excuse me, um, they're in, uh, maybe it's Budapest, and they tell the, they tell the people in the, in the temple to, they better make, you know, plans because the Nazis are coming and they're going to get you. And, and they said, oh, they, they said, no, you're, that's ridiculous. You know, they just, they couldn't believe that it would happen, you know, and, you know, like you said, the warning signs. It's, um, it was very common, as Dr. Berenbaum, our Holocaust scholar, says, that the optimists uh, stayed and the pessimists left, and it was the optimists who stayed who were murdered. Because those who said, this isn't going to happen, That's... unfortunately were murdered. And those like my father, who was a pessimist and said, oh, yes, it is, yeah. said, I'm out of here. So that's a very interesting commentary to think about um, yeah. Yeah. when watching the film. As much as I am loath to mention Eamon Guth, the butcher of Krakow, uh, since Ben speaks of him, I was uh, interested that he is shown in your film because I believe he's the same Eamon Guth that's in Schindler's yeah. List. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I mean, Schindler's List is a very informative and very incredible film um, and uh, and really does highlight, uh, the, you know, the, the atrocity of the butcher of Krakow. And, you know, and I was very familiar with that movie. Um, and so when Ben told us this story, I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, it's it's it's, it's putting like, you know, a character from a film, which almost feels fictional in some ways, you know, because you see it in a narrative film, not a documentary, but to place it in the same room, place him in the same room as people that you are very close to, which we were with the Niger family. Stunning, stunning. And I know what you mean, because I felt the same way. The minute I saw the visual that he was in the crack. Of course he was in the crack ghetto, but when you watch Schindler's List, you're not thinking crack ghetto. And yeah. so here you are and you go, wait a minute. I know this guy. He was in Schindler's List. Yes. So I thought that was a really excellent connection to make that here was a family who actually was in that same ghetto. So yeah. now it's March 1943. The family is still together. They're all in the ghetto, but they have decided that they're going to figure out a way to escape the ghetto. And um, they come up with a plan, particularly the one that Hanka has. And that's the one that spoke to me personally. So first tell us about that plan. And then I'm going to tell you how that happened in my family as well. Well, they, uh, their, their parents and particularly their mother uh, had a vegetable stand in, in, the, in, the, in the ghetto. Um, Could you speak up a little bit, please? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the mother, uh, Sarah and, uh, and, and Herman, they had a vegetable stand uh, in, the, in the ghetto. Um, and so they had, very, they had good connections with farmers outside the, outside the ghetto. And Sarah was a very um, clever woman and very resilient and very um, resourceful. 
very resourceful. So she, she, she made, you know, she got, in, and Herman was also a, a soccer player and he had, he was part of a, a, a soccer team that had Christian players. So they devised this uh, plan to um, pay a farmer uh, to come into the ghetto with his uh, cart in the middle of the night and they built, they hollowed out the bottom of the, of the cart and um, the farmer came in to deliver his goods and, um, and uh, the, the family slipped into the bottom of the, of the vegetable cart and um, the, they basically went out of the ghetto um, without being noticed because they were, the, the guards were so used to this farmer coming in and out that they didn't question him at all and uh so you know he risked his life um doing that you know uh, all along the way they had people who risked their lives just to help them and you know and they made plans sorry yeah you're gonna say are you ready for for this um and and i bring this in because it proves that film is not fantasy that this film is a fantasy, that it is real and it happened to other people. So my mother, whose name, by the way, was Sarah. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, and my father and I and my infant brother escaped uh, in 1941. And the rest of the Klein family, my grandfather, my grandmother, my Aunt Gizzy, cousins, all were taken to the Kosice ghetto in Kosice, Slovakia. They too knew the man who came in with the cart every day to deliver fruits and vegetables. So my grandfather instructed my Aunt Gizzy, who was only 16, he said, I know him. When he comes in, tell him you're the daughter of Rav Klein and ask him if he'll take you out. And that's how my aunt escaped the ghetto. Amazing. So I, when I saw that, I went, oh my God, that's exactly what happened to my family. Wow. And my aunt ultimately uh, migrated. We found her and uh, lived with her most of my teenage years in Cleveland, Ohio. So these stories are real. They're not fantasy these things could happen if you were lucky. Some people were lucky, others were not. Yeah. Okay, so back to the film, Out of the Ghetto. Let's talk now uh, about the challenges and the obstacles they faced, where to go, what to do. Now they're out of the ghetto. They have to, first of all, this, they had decided they were going to try to get papers as Christians. They were going to try to go to the border of Czechoslovakia, which kind of confused me a little bit, John. Czechoslovakia had already been occupied by the Nazis. It was just as dangerous to be in Czechoslovakia as Poland. Why were they headed towards Czechoslovakia? Well, I think, Although I think where I think, could they go? All of Europe at that point, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think every part of this is my understanding, and I could be wrong because I'm not an expert. I was. Um, it was my understanding that parts of Czechoslovakia were occupied and parts weren't. You know, here I am supposed to be a some kind of a scholar, but obviously I'm not because I didn't know that. But nevertheless, we can we'll certainly get people that yeah. will. Uh, <laughs> well, no, and that's a really good point because we were talking. We talked about that a lot, and we tried to read up about it as much as we could because. Yes, it was a question. Well, the only the only discrepancy I can see there is that Czechoslovakia back and forth between 39 and 43 became Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. For example, yeah. my native language is Hungarian. And it's true that the Hungarian Jews were not yet taken on trains till 44. And as far as the Kushitsa Jews of Slovakia, you're right, they were protected. They were not yet being transported until 1944 also. So maybe that's what they had heard 
that yeah. the Jews were still safe. Okay, that could possibly be the answer. Yeah, and I think but, that, you know, that to get to the, they had to get to the Czech border so they could get a train to get to Hungary. Or, right. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. So, so um, now they, 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 tell us a little bit about that challenge uh, that the, that you'll see on the film of of the various things that they had to overcome. There's a family of five. By the way, how old was the youngest at that point? Um, the youngest child is Tosha, and she was actually born just after the war. Okay. So, so there was four of them. Um, Basha was three years old uh, okay. when they escaped. So they ranged from like three to five or six to 10 to 12. Ah, um, it's amazing, amazing. Oh, yeah. and, and, and I, you know, it, just an interesting point that I always think about a family of, a family, father, mother, and four small children doing anything together is, there's a lot of planning to go on, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of worried about who, where you're going to go to the bathroom, where you're going to eat, who's going to do what, you know, that, you know, making sure everybody's, you know, comfortable, blah, blah, blah. but this is like, you know, insanity, right? I mean, you know, it is going on a day trip to the, to the beach with, with kids is a challenge for parents, you know, and yep. I, you know, they just, they had to, they trekked the father carried the small child on his back. Um, they had to trek through snow, which, you know, was very deep uh, for the, the. It's it's really almost unbelievable if it weren't absolutely true. Yeah. 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 They, they had to hide under the snow at some points uh, when the Nazi guards, would, the Nazis would come through on horseback and, uh, God, you know, they just um, they had to sleep in little hunting huts and. You know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. It's just really it's an amazing. amazing story of the father's perseverance and the mother's, as you say, resourcefulness. And they're the uh, they a perfect, perfect pair for this, you know, because he was an athlete. He had the strength, you know, he had the physical strength and endurance, you know, being a professional soccer player. Um, and the mother just she was just one of these crafty people. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, you know, she, she was, she would take no, you know, she wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, I mean, she just, she, she had her mindset and there was no stopping her. I mean, there's a lot I know about her from, you know, after the war and, and her personality and, and her, um, you know, she was a very strong personality. Uh, well, you know, this is a really good time to even mention um, a work that I'm very involved in, and that's starting to hear the voices of the women of the Holocaust, because too much, you know, over the years has been, well, that that has not come up enough, and there's been a lot of research now, a book recently by Judy Battalion, and my own work on women in the Holocaust uh, it's amazing, uh, the women resistors, the women fighters, and then the lesser known women like Sarah in the film, who in, in, in most of my studies, I have found that the families like the Niger family, including my own family, it was my mother's resourcefulness that got us through. It was my father's persistence, my mother's resourcefulness. Um, so now the next big challenge that I found very painful is that the family has to separate at one point uh, in order for them to all be saved. And Ben is the one that they have to hide and separate from and, and uh, his dad takes him into the forest and leaves him on his own in like a what a tree house or a, a hut of some kind and yeah. leaves him there. and for ben who narrates a great deal of the last half of the film this is a very traumatic experience that he can never even today 
as an adult forgive or forget about? Uh, let's talk about that a little bit and wh yeah. what you felt in filming it and interviewing him. Well, I totally can understand. So what happens is that Ben um, uh, and his father are, you know, both circumcised and they were, you know, the Nazis would come in and, and, and check, even if you're, you know, if you, even if you had Christian papers and you were pretending to be Christian, there was still that risk. So they knew that that was a possibility. And they, so they hid Ben in the, in the forest. Um, ben thought, you know, they were going to come back and get him and which, you know, they very, that I think that was their plan was to, you know, when it, when it was safe to come back and get him and then, and then they could move along to the next place. Um, they had to flee where they were. The family had to flee the village so they could not get back to Ben. So Ben was stuck in this forest as a 12 year old boy alone. And for one day, that would be traumatic for, for, for a child of that age, you know? Um, he ended up spending months surviving on his own in this woods. Um, you know, whether the family, you know, and he thinks that they, you know, he has it in his mind that, that they did it to save the, the rest of the family. Um, that was sort of his rationale for it. The rest of the family said, no, that's not the case. We, we, we wanted to get back to you, but we just, we just had to flee, you know, um, the scar is there no matter what the reason is, um, you know, for a child of that age, it, it's just, it's post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, um, and, you know, it just, uh, it just stays with, it just stays with him his whole life. Um, as all the, you know, that he, he did, you know, he says he doesn't forgive them or, or forget about it, but he had a wonderful relationship with his father the rest of his life. I mean, they, you know, he adored his dad. So it wasn't like he was alienated from the family, you know, once they all got back together. Um, it's just the scar. It's just the scar that, you know, when you're, you know, you, sometimes you think back on something that happened in your childhood. Somebody said something to, to you that you just never forget, you know, mm -hmm. um, that this was a, a major incident that he just, there's no way of getting it out of him, you know, whatever the reasoning is. And uh, it's an incredible Ben story alone is like, you know, a film into itself, you know? Yes, it is. So tell us about the family today. Uh, if those of you who have seen the film, there's a wonderful ending where you see the whole family. And for those of you who haven't, I hope that we've inspired you enough to watch it. Um, how do they eventually get to America? Where do they all end up? Where do they all live? Where are they today? They all ended up, um, well, first they went to uh, Munich after the war and they got educated in Munich. Really? Yeah, um, oddly enough. Uh, but I think it was, um, you know, the German government was giving education to Jews. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they, they took full advantage of that. And um, then they eventually came to one, you know, Sesha, the oldest sister came to New York and then the rest of them followed. Uh, she kind of set up, she, the, she was the oldest. So she was sort of like the, you know, another sort of mother figure to them. Um, she set up a, a base in New York City, and then then one by one they all they all followed and came to New York, and they all ended up on the east side of Manhattan. And they, you know, they just hang out together all the time. Um, you know, I've been to many many lunches with them. Uh, you know, and they, you know, you know, it's hard to get siblings together like once a year for a holiday, right? These guys do it all the time. Isn't that wonderful? You know, and when did their parents die? Um, she's, I guess that was probably at least 20 years ago was the mother and the father before that. So, yeah. Um, when's the last time that you saw them all together before anyone passed? And the last, that the picture of the film, when was that? That was in, uh, 2016. 
And tell us about the two or three who died yeah. of COVID. Well, That's yeah, ba Basha, um, right after that, the end of the film, you see them all together at a table chatting and, uh, and Basha um, died uh, the next uh, fall after that um, uh, of cancer. And then um, Sesha and, 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 uh, and Hanka um, passed away in 2020 of, of COVID. Um, How tragic. Just, uh, just shocking. I mean, for us as filmmakers, we were very close to them, you know, um, and you, you, when you're making a film, you live with them every day when you're editing, you just, you get to know them so well. Mm -hmm. And we had gotten to know them so well by, by hanging out with them. You know, we went to seders, we went to bat mitzvahs, we went to Hanukkah celebrations. We were part of the family. It's not, it's nothing compared to what the family went through when the, they died of COVID because they couldn't memorialize them. You know, it was, it was just, it happened and you couldn't have a, have a proper uh, goodbye you know, during COVID and- uh, Terrible, just terrible. So it's just tragic. And I'm just, I'm just, you know, the good part about it is that we, we did got, we captured their story. You yes. Know, we got their story and, um, you know, it's symbolic of the whole thing to me, you know, uh, that these, you know, we, we were lucky to have firsthand accounts. Um, but now they're, you know, these firsthand accounts are dying off. Mm -hmm. um, as the years go by a very you know it's been a while now and so um and also you know which we dealt with in this um they were getting dementia so the memory was going so you know so it's like it to me it was symbolic the memory is fading the people are dying this is why it's so important to make these films to tell these stories because the first-hand accounts will not be there and uh, you know, like you said, this is a story that it's it has to just keep being told, keep being reminded of what can happen. And this wasn't that long. I mean, you think about it; it's not that long ago. It's, it's interesting. I heard a saying at Yad Vashem that we should not only talk about the six million Jews, but we should talk about it six million times. It's good. That's a good quote. Yeah, and God bless you that you took this on. What were your major challenges while making the film? Um, I guess the major challenges, I, and I wouldn't call them that big of a challenge, but um, just it, it was just sort of gaining the trust of the family, you know, mm -hmm. because we were basically, you know, we, we met Hanka, but, you know, she's just had to tell them, oh, this is this couple uh john and andriette that want to make this film you know and they're like okay well who are they you know so we had to you know we, it took us a while it took us uh you know months and and, and and years really to to uh you know to gain their trust and to you know get them comfortable enough to really open up and share the story um so initially you know basha had said no to the, to the doing it um, why why um, she just didn't feel like she wanted to talk about it but but after a while you know like i said we saw her at parties and things and so she called me up one day and this was months months after she said she wouldn't be a part of it and she called me up one day and i was actually at the same cafe uh where i met haka and um i she she said john this is basha and i said hi how are you and she said why should i do your film and I'm like, okay, uh, well, uh, let me think. <laughs> uh, because this will be something that you can hand down, your story will be handed down and told to your, your, your son and, and his daughter and, and beyond that. And, and she said, I'll do it. Are they happy now that Are you they, did it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know it's, uh, it's a gift to us, you know, as filmmakers, it was a gift to us to be able to get to know this family. And who did they? Um, who did they marry? Did they marry just American guys and women, or 
did they marry other survivors? Tell us a little bit about that. Sesha, the oldest. So Sesha during the film was, was suffering from dementia. Um, and so we really couldn't interview her, except at the very end, you see Sesha say one thing, uh, which was very poignant to me to, that, that all of a sudden she, she spoke. Um, you know, Bash is, uh, Bash is saying, we, we have the best time together. We, can, we laugh together. And Sesha says, and we also cry together. And uh, that's the only thing that Sesha says in the whole film. But Sesha was a very successful doctor in New York City. Oh, and um, right. she married a a man, uh, Mark, who was um, uh, uh, an Auschwitz survivor. How interesting! And they they were very they were they were sort of um, very like another set of parents for the for the other siblings. They you know they brought them to New York. They set, they were very successful. They made, they made uh, good money and they set up everybody. They helped everybody out um, in the family, you know, with their, with their, you know, getting. How about them. Ben? Ben, gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. His story is unbelievable. Well, Ben went to Israel and joined the Israeli army. Uh, you know, think of that, you know, <laughs> you get out of the Holocaust, you have to go join the army. Um, and, uh, he said that he, he, he was, a trained as a sniper or something. He said, but he could never shoot anybody, he never shot anybody. He couldn't do it, but he came to the United States and became an engineer and Ben like developed, he worked for NASA and developed like, uh, this sort of, uh, uh, technology, um, for NASA He's, he's has, he has tons of patents. He's invented like the dimmer switch. Like he's like an incredible guy, you know, uh, he's, he's had, uh, many lives. Uh, and, uh, does he have a family of his own? He has, uh, three children, um, uh, wonderful people. Um, what about uh, Hanka? Did she have a profession? Yes. Hanka was, um, uh, uh, she ran a, um, uh, a psychology clinic. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. How about that red hat? Um, interesting, yeah. particularly the red dress from Schindler's List. I know, right? I'm sure you were thinking of that when you decided to have a couple of shots with the red hat in color. Yeah, I mean, it was just, uh, you know, that was the story, you know, um, in her book, The Red Hat. Um, it just, it was, it was her security blanket um when she going through all this you know she, her mother bought her the red hat when they got locked into the ghetto and uh she never took it off um and uh it, it really was her uh I'm, I'm sure you're doing this already if you aren't i would strongly recommend that you get somebody to write you a study guide and the red hat would be a very important question because if students and teachers see the film, teachers like to have uh, some kind of little study guide. No, I'm not going to do it because I've done hundreds of them and I'm done with that, <laughs> but unless you beg me, but um, it is something that I would strongly consider for you to do. Finally, um, my yes. last question to you would be, um, what are your hopes and plans for this film? From the beginning, I always wanted to tell this story so that everybody could hear it in, it was, okay, let me, let me start again. It, basically for educational purposes, um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to distribute this to schools, to Jewish institutions. And know, non Jewish. And museums, yeah, um, you know, to distribute it as, as widely as possible, you know, to, to get this story um, to affect people and to... Uh... Well, I, I, I hope that Igor, the executive director of the Miami Jewish Film Festival, and I can help you with that. Um, I love it. I think it's excellent. I think it's a beautiful piece for students and teachers. It 
shows the reality of the horrors of the Nazis and the Holocaust, but it does show resilience, hope, resourcefulness, and survival, yeah. which uh, is extremely yeah. important. Yeah, it's a, it was a fine balance, you know, that we had to, you know, because it is inspirational and there is joy, there's joy and love in it, you know, which is, you know, sounds strange to say in a Holocaust film, but, no. you know, that, well, love is the only thing that's going to survive in in any of these kind of horrors. If it's if there isn't love, kindness, caring, empathy, then we're just going to continue down this road, and that's exactly what we want to wipe out with showing films like this. I just wish I would have met you at that cafe. What's the name of that cafe in New Jersey? New York, uh, Lower East Side. It was called Angelina Cafe back then, but they changed the name. But um, I just also want to say that uh, we had an incredible team uh, on this film. Um, my partner, Andrea Redman, and I, you know, we produced the film together and we did, you know, we did all the interviews together and we, you know, we were the ones that sort of together gained the trust of the family. Um, we have Frank London, uh, who did the musical score, who has a group called the Klezmatics, who are Grammy winning. Uh, and Frank is a premier uh, Jewish musician uh, known worldwide. Um, beautiful music, um, which inspired us to make the make to, as we were making the film, his music really inspired us. Um, our editor, Patty Schumann, uh, I've known her since I was 15 years old. <laughs> uh um you know she did an incredible job she she absorbed this this story and this and the telling of the story you know tremendously and, and really grateful for her and her husband dave steck who did uh, the finishing and our co-producers um terry stone and uh, uh lola denizio who did the research uh the Hol holocaust research um and my other co-producer is my friend David Sherwin, who I've known since I was 12 years old and I went to his bar mitzvah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful family that we had making this film, which, you know, which helps a lot. You're to be very proud of it. I think it's wonderful and it has been a joy and a pleasure for me to personally meet you and to have this time with you. And certainly uh, down the road after the Miami Jewish Film Festival, I'd like to connect with you again about helping you to distribute the film uh, for teachers and educational purposes. That's so nice. And, and I really, really, am, we are really grateful to the Miami Jewish Film Festival for, for letting us be a part of this. And um, and we're we're honored to be to be a part of it. Really, it's 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 tremendous for us. So we we, so, we are well, very thankful. Very thankful. With that, I say to you, God bless you for the work you did, and my regards to the remaining family. I hope I meet them someday. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for this superb superb hour. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.